Hi, I'm Andrew Tsao. We have a very special edition of Backstory today. Now in its 38th year, the Seattle International Film Festival has built a strong community around the art of cinema for generations. We're going to hear from SIF's artistic director, Carl Spence, about what we can expect at the 2012 festival. And we're also talking to T.J. Martin, whose film Undefeated debuted last year at another major festival, the South by Southwest Film Festival in Austin, Texas. After premiering, Undefeated was immediately picked up by a major distributor and went on to win the Oscar for Best Documentary Feature. Carl, thanks for being here. TJ, welcome to Backstory. Thanks, sir. Before we get into the subject of films, filmmaking, film festivals, and distribution, I want to give our audiences a little background on Undefeated, the Oscar-winning documentary you made. And we are going to show them a little trailer, but I think what might be interesting to know first is how the subject matter ultimately came to you. I think you read about it through an associate or a friend who brought it to your attention first. Correct. It was our producer, Rich Minimus, who uh, found the article that eventually he sent to my co-director and I, um, Dan Lindsay and I. Mm -hmm. And the article, so Rich went to the University of Tennessee and he's an avid, you know, football freak to say the least. And he was following the recruiting um, and he was watching, he was looking at the message boards and he stumbled upon this name, O.C. Brown. He'd never heard of him before and he Googled his name and this article appeared from the Commercial Appeal, which is the local paper in, mm -hmm. in Memphis, about O.C. living part-time with his coach in East Memphis, which is much more affluent, predominantly white, and part-time with his uh, grandmother in North Memphis, which is a poverty-stricken community, predominantly black. Um, and the reason he was living in East Memphis uh, was to try to get his grades up. He was a, he was a big recruit, um, but uh, his grades were suffering and the coaches couldn't find anyone to go into the community of North Memphis after dark to go tutor him. So he had to actually so leave his neighborhood. So they decided to bring him out of his neighborhood and live part-time with his coach during the week to get him tutored. And this is Manassas High School. This is Manassas about. High School in North Memphis. So uh, Rich sent that article to Dan and I, um, and you know, it, was, it, it wasn't it was anything that original that we hadn't seen before, but if, if you know a little bit about Memphis, it's definitely kind of, um, uh, an other side of a tracks type of town. Mm -hmm. um, and we thought it was, uh, maybe there was a potential to, to tell kind of an interesting coming of age film um, about this kid navigating these two seemingly disparate communities. Mm -hmm. So we went out there to do an exploratory mission to see if there was a story there. And that's when we met the head coach, Coach Bill, who if you've seen the movie is a very gregarious, charismatic, I always say he's like the most charismatic man I've ever met in my mm -hmm. entire life. Mm -hmm very charismatic character, and he told us <clears throat> anecdotes of um, kind of uh, things that have happened in the years in years past and well, how the program got turned around. Well, because the Manassas program, from what I understand, yeah. was a program that was li uh, living in, in poverty and, and, and really didn't have resources yeah. and, and the sort of things we associate typically now with you know, uh, high school athletics that are yeah. preparing students for college athletics. They were kind of like the perennial whipping boy of sorts. Like right. they would literally, uh, and I never knew this happened in high school, uh, uh, but they would literally go sell their home games. So they would sell their home games to a county team for their like, for the county team's homecoming. Literally they would pay them to come out there, and this is like a team of like 20 kids. Mm -hmm get their butts whooped, uh -huh. and then feed them some pizza, and then they go back to Memphis. Right. And it just totally demoralized all the kids. And so the program um, just never got an opportunity to flourish. So uh, Bill Courtney, the, who's a lumberman and in, in, happens to have a lumber yard in, in the in North Memphis area, which yeah. is like blocks away from Manassas, yeah. um, one of his employees started volunteering there as an like as just a volunteer coach and he said you know bill you've got a background in coaching I, I think you should really come out here and check this out um you know maybe just give them a couple pointers um next i think you and know. you know he shows up and then next thing you know five years later he's you know acting as the head coach right. as a volunteer coach right. and he completely turned the program around to now you know there's 60 kids that come out for varsity and they're completely suited up and they started a program called uh, a foundation called the Man Rights Foundation, and that really acts as a booster club uh -huh. um, for um, Manassas High School so they don't have to go sell their games. And that was kind of the beginning of the turnaround. So we came in, 
uh, the 2009 season when they really had a chance at um, going to the playoffs mm -hmm. for the first time. They mm -hmm. never won a playoff game in the history of this 110 year history of the school, never won a playoff game. Mm -hmm. And so really the trajectory of the film is them as a team trying to win a playoff game. But, you know, that's really the spine of the film. It's much more of a character study. It's much more of a coming of age film. And of course, being a documentary filmmaker, you and I were just chatting about this before we started uh, shooting the show today. Um, I think you said something like uh, you had amassed over 500 hours yeah. of footage. Yeah, I highly, I don't recommend that shooting ratio. Right, so, yeah. so uh, obviously what I get from that is storylines, themes, ideas emerge while you're living it because you're immersed in that world. You're not, yeah. you're not sort of observing from afar. You're day to daying this yeah. experience, right? Well, it was really, I mean, we fought for a long time. We fought the sports story. We were, we were thinking it was going to be much more of a hoop dreams type thing where you're, you're more in the homes and you're a little away from, from okay. kind of the, the, uh, the sports aspect of it. But you know, it's also naive of us to think that because you forget when you're in high school, what do you do in the day? You're in school. That's right. When you're in sports, what do you do after that? You're in the sport, That's you right. know, at practice. That's right. And then every, you're, the whole thing, your, your entire life revolves around the sport. Mm -hmm. So um, that's when we started realizing there's, you know, it, it, we realized, well, if this is going to be a sports film, we better make a really good sports film. Okay. But to answer your question, it was, it, it was really important for us. The only way to make this film was to actually move to Memphis. Yeah. Um, so we uprooted our lives from L.A. and moved to Memphis, and we were there for nine months. And it was also important for us not to um, uh, introduce too many bodies into the world. We wanted to leave the slightest footprint as possible. So, so how big is the crew? That the goes crew out there? is three people. Okay. One of which that's, that's is a our small producer footprint. who yeah. comes from kind of the development world, so we'd never done active production. Okay. So that just limits it to my directing partner and I shooting, cutting, doing sound, everything. Um, and that's and but that was really important for us. It was integral to do it in that manner because that's we wanted a level of intimacy immersion is the and point. immersion yeah we we really wanted uh, we want in the doc space we're much more interested in films that unfold where life unfolds in front of the camera and it's less anecdotal yes and so in, in this case we want something intimate so it was really important for us to earn the to gain the trust of the community gain the trust of the kids um to the point where the, the, the audience is brought in as, it's a much more experiential film. Mm -hmm. The audience is almost like an extension of the team over the course of the film. All right, let's take a look at the trailer for Undefeated. Let's see here. Starting right guard shot, no longer in school. Starting wheel linebacker shot, no longer in school. Two players fighting right in front of the coach. Start and center arrested. Most coaches, that would be pretty much a career's worth of crap to deal with. I think that sums up the last two weeks for me. For almost 14 years, we never won a football game. Oh my God in heaven. Chavis has serious anger issues. Stop. Stop. You go over there, Mike. Right. Montreal is dealing with the death of his father. When he died, I knew I was on my own. Number 77, O.C. Brown. O.C.'s well, grades wasn't up like they're supposed to be. He's going to lose an opportunity to go do something with his life. I want them to rise above that or say knock. Man open, and he dropped it. The answer's about to fall to 0 and 1. Anybody can be a champ. It takes a man to stand up when this thing hits you in the mouth because it hurts. Everybody says when you get these inner city kids down, they'll lay over and you'll beat them by 40. Not us. You got to believe in yourselves, fellas. Four of those guys have taken some beating here. Oh. There's a Manassas player down. God, I hope we didn't just lose him. Two things mean both. The same thing to him in the world is his father and football. And we got to make sure we're there for him. Money. Whatever you're going through, I promise it'll get better. This is an unbelievably good opportunity. You're down 20 nothing. You come back from that, now you're talking about something. 103 to go. Season comes to a close for somebody here tonight. You think football builds character. It does not. 
He's going to throw it. He pulls it bigger. Football reveals character. This is it! Let's go! Well, it looks like a very special project, and I want to now sort of move our conversation to your journey in relation to the film. Months of arduous post-production, the film gets made, it premieres at the South by Southwest Film Festival, it's picked up by the Weinstein Company for distribution, and to top it all off, you find yourself an Oscar winner. It yeah. doesn't sound like you're talking about me. That, you, that, who is this person? This is, what I'm, you know, this is what I'm so interested now in getting a glimpse into is your life and the transformation that occurred. I mean, when you were out there or in, wherever you were logging the hundreds of hours, <laughs> right, bleary-eyed, I don't think you imagine you'd be picking up the statuette. No you know, a year later. So what, you know, give us a glimpse into that year of your life. Well, I can tell you this, you don't make documentaries for money and you don't make documentaries just to win awards. I mean, before we started taping, you and I were just chatting about things you'd done before and you were telling me a little bit about couch surfing and being in Hawaii and in New York yeah. and sort of finding your way and picking up a few freelance gigs and, and PAing. So you've been there, you've, yeah. you've lived the life uh, sure. of the dues paying filmmaker. So now the ship comes in. And so what's the single most transformative thing that's occurred <laughs> to you in this time? The single most transformative thing? I don't know if there's one thing. I can tell you the most rewarding is, uh, and to be 100% quite honest with you, the most rewarding experience is to watch an audience watch the film and have a um, very visceral reaction to watching the movie. And, and Dan and I always talk about, you know, it, we always used to say in post, if, if the, the, the process of making the film was really emotional for us. Sure. If we can somehow, when we were cutting the film, we were saying if we can somehow translate what we went through for somebody else, then we've succeeded. And if you can somehow hold that feeling that you got from living the story yeah. and translate it to an audience, and clearly it happened because everything I've read about the audience reactions at South by Southwest were, were that it was yeah. great emotion shown by the audience and, and great appreciation. And that, of course, uh, is a large factor in what happened to the film. Yeah. So that's fascinating to, to hear that for you, it was the, the connection to audiences and oh, sharing sure. the story that yeah. was... Uh, really important. So you went to the festival, of course. Yeah. And so I, I'm curious, Carl, you know, you've been involved in this business for quite a while. And so you have a unique perspective on what the festival world means to film, filmmaking and film distribution. And I'm sure you've participated in some transformative moments uh, with filmmakers as well. How did this come to be? And, you know, what, what, tell us a little bit about the nature of this relationship, because I'm sure you're also going to tell me it isn't all hugs and smiles when it comes to distribution either, but so it's got to be a complicated story. Well, it's, I think it's complicated, but it's actually pretty simple. It is really, as TJ said, it's really about the uh, connection with the audience, and that's, the, that's how I discovered festivals. I didn't even know what a festival was. What, the first time uh, I sort of happened into actually the Seattle Film Festival and uh, saw a film that the, the sort of the entire audience was electrified and mm -hmm. it was sort of a transformative experience. So, mm -hmm. so uh, I mean, traditionally festivals has really been a place to help filmmakers find uh, their voice, mm -hmm. to find an audience, connect, the, also connect them to uh, other filmmakers so they can actually make those long sort of uh, life-changing connections and meet perhaps uh, filmmakers they'll work with mm -hmm. or collaborate with. Um, so that's the most important thing festivals have done and continue to do. I mean, the biggest thing that's changed, and uh, I think with Undefeated, it's a success story that doesn't happen a lot because films don't often get picked up out of festivals as much as they as they used to. There's a, there's a, those few that do, and so that's you know it's an amazing story um, to celebrate that that Undefeated uh, had that such an amazing rise from mm -hmm. when it debuted at a festival to when it got released to winning an, an Academy Award. Um, you know, that doesn't that happens that happens to maybe like. Not very many filmmakers. No, it doesn't. <laughs> but <laughs> that's why it's always so weird. It just yeah. But then it's you know, but it's maybe it's it's the holy grail that everyone you know aspires to. So, um, but really, it's about that. I mean, the festival creates sort of an energy and an opportunity for for things to happen, uh, and so that's really where it starts. And so, and I even get excited when I'm 
I get more excited seeing a film with the audience after we've selected it and seeing it in the festival, sitting in the back and just sort of seeing the audience respond is, yeah. is as exciting to me as when I'm, uh, more exciting to me actually than seeing it by myself in a screening room. So um, do, do distributors now, explain this to me, uh, do they go purposely to the festivals to gauge that kind of reaction? Are they, are they doing a little pre-test marketing and going, you know, let's see how the audience, you know, responds to this film for them to make decisions about that? It all depends on where the, the film is in its, in its uh, sort of stage of its life. But if it's been picked up already, then they, yeah, they'll use the festival screening to see how, it, how audiences react with it. And that, that may redefine how they um, release the film mm. or how they market it. Like test screenings, yeah. almost. Yeah, but uh -huh. for I think it film, depends on the festival. Too, yeah, it right? depends yeah. on the festival. I mean, Seattle's a huge audience festival. It's not a huge industry festival, and films have been, you know, quietly picked up out of Seattle. But it's not like there's been a. There's not as if there's been a bidding war. Right. And even um, in South by Southwest, it's not like there's bidding wars. But it's, uh, but uh, like there have been, and it's maybe Sundance, but still, it's um, you know, it's just interesting to see. They're looking for films. Well, they're looking for films that they can. I mean, it's a business. Even yeah. though we're making, you know, we we call it art, but distributors are really in, in it for the business. Of course, and of course. some are more in in it for the art as well as the business. And you can see that with some distributors from their taste of films and what they pick up. Sure. But, um, but they're just looking to see how, yeah, what where's that magic sort of special sauce that's going to create that that um, excitement that's going to cause something to explode. And, just, and, 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 of, and of course, you know, this, this word we use, buzz, mm -hmm. is huge, right? I mean, yeah. you, you say Seattle's an audience festival, but buzz out of Seattle is meaningful to a filmmaker anywhere, I would think. It, it, you know, it's different than if you're screening at Sundance or Telluride or a festival that is known more as a distributor's market or something right. like that, but certainly the sort of uh, as you say, atmosphere of the festival, right. you know, gives everyone involved a sort of clear view of what's happening with a project yeah. and, and what it might be appropriate for. And on the downside, you know, what didn't work. And I'm sure you've experienced that quite a bit, too. So so how many years have you been artistic director now, Carl, for Seattle? Uh, I've been for about eight, eight years, I think. Okay. Um, and it's, uh, it's been great because it's, it's the greatest job in the world other than probably making films to be able to watch films yeah. and be paid for it. Uh, making uh, films is overrated. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can swap. <laughs> yeah. Or you can do a documentary about, about film about festivals. Film festivals you know, you know, I think that would be very, like yeah, that. I don't think that's very interesting. But <laughs> well, I don't know. I, from what I understand, by the, jobs, time you guys, <laughs> by the time you guys get into the, the, the hundred thousandth yeah. hour of screening, I think that's a great <laughs> yeah. image, is to just look at them going, we have one more to look at oh. you know, because I understand you and your staff go through a very rigorous and intensive and thorough process um, are, you, are you guys the biggest and the longest I think you know, North American film in uh, Toronto is bigger in size of a number of uh, films uh, that they show an audience but we're pretty close as far as the number of films um, but we're the largest in the United States in terms of number of films we show in the audience which is uh, well, this year is actually we're showing more uh, we're showing about 270 features and 180 short films from 75 countries. Wow. So it's one of our largest editions ever. Uh, not our biggest ever, but we're also on more screens because now we've moved into a year-round home at the SIF Film Center and we acquired the historic Uptown Cinemas. So we have great. four screens we're running year-round and uh, we're going to utilize those during the festival. So we, so we have a little bit more we can do. And uh, there's a lot of films. We had over 5,000 films um, submitted to us uh, for consideration. So Absolutely. that includes shorts, features, documentaries, you know, everything under the sun. Right. But, but I mean, it's a lot of material to, to wade through. Well, I, I just want to say, as someone who grew up in Seattle, it's just such good news that SIF took over the Uptown because you know all of us thought, here goes another gem, another neighborhood gem that'll become another whatever. and just the idea that the variety of films you have will be programmed. And you do pro year-round programming there, because I've, I've gone to screenings there as well, so it's fantastic. We're going to take a short break right now, but stay with us to hear more about this year's Seattle International Film Festival. For the 38th Festival, 2012, Carl, can you give us a little sneak peek of some of the uh, key moments that we can expect at the festival? Yes, it's, a, it's actually it's a pretty exciting year because there's a lot of great Seattle films and films here from Washington State, uh, which is, I think, very important because the, the incentive to film here just uh, got re-upped and passed. So we'll be opening with Lynn Shelton's film, Your Sister's Sister, 
which is extraordinary, shot here and up in the San Juan Islands. We're closing with the world premiere of a film by Stephen Gyllenhaal called Grassroots that is based on the true story of Grant Cogswell and his uh, attempt to run for city council on a monorail platform. And that was shot here in Seattle. It was shot here well. in Seattle. Uh, our centerpiece gal is a great French film uh, starring Jean Reno called The Chef. It's a culinary comedy. And uh, fittingly, since uh, we have, uh, I'm sitting here with an Academy Award winning director, we'll have, uh, we're honoring two, um, two Academy Award winners at the festival for their achievements. Sissy Spacek will be receiving uh, an award for her work in acting, and uh, William Friedkin, director of The Exorcist, yeah. uh, he has a new film. The French that's, Connection, that's in, yes. French Connection, we'll be showing both of those. But he has a new film uh, starring Matthew McConaughey and Gina Gershon, uh, Emil Hirsch, and uh, Juno Temple called Killer Joe, fantastic. which is, uh, yeah, it's a fantastic film. And so we'll be honoring him with a Lifetime Achievement Award at the festival. And we'll be honoring TJ as well. Yes, we're also giving award. him an award. Of course, he has an Oscar, so he needs, uh, you know, the, oh, the yes, he has a Seattle Award. He needs the award from the festival for Any directing. More awards. Yes. yes. Is that acceptable? I mean, we have a connection uh, previously because he actually, he shot one of our fly films uh, years ago. Yeah, let's, let's, uh, let's get just a moment of background on fly films because not all our viewers know it. Those of us who are familiar with the festival right. understand it, but just give us, a, give us a brief look into what fly films is and then you can tell us about your experience with it. Fly Films is, a, is an experience where we, um, we, we give filmmakers an opportunity, mostly new filmmakers who maybe made some shorts but haven't made a feature, to make a short film under constrained circumstances where it's a, over a limited number of days, they have a limited number of time, there's all these restrictions. And uh, so we basically, in many ways, we produce and uh, give an opportunity to make a film within a scope of a week. And then we show it at the festival. So it, it, when it first started out, we shot on film. So they actually had to shoot it on film. And then they what if actually the lab had a, doesn't deliver your yeah, print. Exactly, they had a week to shoot it, and actually get it edited, and actually get a print made in order to show it on the big screen. Uh, now we've gone back and forth. Sometimes we shoot in film, shoot in film, and sometimes we do digital. And we're we're going back to digital this year because okay. film is going away. Well, it gives them a little more time. Well, they can for that more. last cut and then hit send, right? Yeah. You can get it out I mean, digitally. The thing, yeah, my, I mean, the, the year I did, I had a lot of Did you have film or did you have di where it was digital? digital? Yeah, and it was oh, you mini did? DV tapes, yeah. and I had a oh, lot mini of technical DV tapes. problems. But yeah. the film is great. I mean, I love film because you only get, you got a certain amount of feet yeah. of film. Here's and, your can. You know, and yeah. if, you, if you run out of it, then that's it. Make your film. Yeah, I had, my film was, it was about a relationship between a, like a man and a copy machine. Yeah. And <laughs> for some reason, I could, I'd never figured out the, the, what the technical problem was. So, but there would, every once in a while, there'd be this like stutter effect in the playback. And so uh -huh. people thought that was a conscious decision. It was an aesthetic choice. <laughs> it was a choice. creative decision. In, like, I really liked the, the stuttering. The, the, like, yeah. you were in an alternate world. I was like, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> that's fantastic. <laughs> well, speak, speaking of alternate worlds, we have this year's trailer for the Seattle International Film Festival. And we've got to give our audiences a peek at this because it's a pretty special trailer. And uh, cool. uh, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, just plant the words uh, Busby Berkeley in the audience's uh, ear before we take a look at it. Here's the trailer for this year's Seattle International Film Festival. And if you watch closely, you're going to see a kaleidoscopic feast of nearly 50 films from past festivals. Over there. Well, we don't want to mix together. <laughs> <laughs> no, can you dig, 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 dig? Wow! I'm exciting. Delicious. Delicious. Just look like you like me, and let's be in time. Here's... That's an unbelievable trailer. I mean, I can't identify all the films, but I certainly picked out a few that, that you premiered at the festival that have gone on uh, to become quite important films. Well, every film that's in the trailer has played at a previous festival, and it's, I've, I've seen it over 20, maybe even 30 times, mm -hmm. maybe more, and every time I see something new. So I really, I don't think I'll get tired watching it. Fantastic. 
So for all the filmmakers out there watching this show and parents of aspiring filmmakers, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera, um, we all know that the world has changed in terms of access to the media. Uh, in, it's digital, mm -hmm. it's less expensive, you can do a lot with a little. But, you know, film festivals, getting films into festivals, how one navigates that as a filmmaker may still be a bit of a mystery. What does someone who's finishing their film or looking to finish their film do in regards to submitting to festivals these days? Well, the first thing is it's really about the film. It's a, you need to make a film, have a, make sure you have a strong story and that you're telling it well. Because that's, I mean, that's really what's, it doesn't matter what kind of packaging it comes in or how you submit it. Uh, I mean, it, it doesn't hurt if you know someone to try to get, you know, get it to the top of the pile because every film gets watched. But you know, there's a, there's a process, and you have, if we have five thousand films being submitted, you know, there's, you know, it's it's a subjective process, so it's possible that things can fall through the cracks. So, um, but uh, I would, you need to have a strategy. So, a lot of people make films and they're like, what do I do next? That's what so, that's what so, we want to so, talk you know, a little bit with you about is is the what do we do next? But before we go there, I was told by a filmmaker recently because I was talking about back in the day where you'd get your little can and you'd stick it in an envelope and mail it off and they were like, you know there's a website where all the film festival submission policies are on, you can click on, what, have you heard of this? Yeah, with, it's, it's called Without, there's without a couple a box, different ones, but the biggest one is Without a Box. Okay. And we use it. Okay. I mean it's, it's great because it, it simplifies the process and, and makes it more organized and, and allows us to sort of manage that flow of information. But at the same time, it means we get inundated with many, many, many more submissions than we did in the past. So it means we have to actually hire more people to wade through those and watch them and, and, and um, you know, so that we can actually get to a point where you can actually make a decision. So the doorway to get your film viewed is yeah. a bit bigger, but the, you're also now in a larger crowd yes. as you go into the festivals. Yeah, and, and the, okay. I think also the digitization of going digital has made it also, that's also the, the, the easy access to, to making a film, and kids making films all the time now, so there's, yeah. so it's, we get all kinds of different, you know, films submitted to us of varying quality and varying levels. Sure. And some that probably really would never see, you know, go anywhere else, and then mm -hmm. there's, the, I mean, the hard part is there's great films that we receive that we also don't end up showing just because we have to make a, a program and a subjective decision of what that program shape is going to look like. And which, you know, if there's two films in the same subject matter or similar subject matter, you're not really going to want to show two unless there's a really specific reason to do that. Mm -hmm. So sometimes, you know, we have to make some a, tough choices. Tough choices, and it's that's the worst part about it is telling a filmmaker that you're not going to show a film even if you really believe in them and they made an extraordinary. Right. Work. And they right. go on to an Academy Award. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, let's, let's, get to, let's get back to this question of, I made a film, what do I do with it now? I mean, so you, yeah, you, I, you live this uh, life. But I couldn't agree more with what you said, though. It's, it, first of all, your, your product has to be good. You have to make a good film. Mm -hmm. You have to somehow stand out from the crowd. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, and it's weird, too, because it's uh, similar to there's no protocol to, there's no one way of getting your film financed. Mm -hmm. There's no one way of making your film. Mm -hmm. There's no one way, there's no protocol to getting it, the attention of the festivals. But somehow, you need to stand out from the crowd. And I think, like you, you mentioned, make a strong product. Um, be, definitely think it through, have a strategy. I think, you know, I think it does, it's unfortunate, but at the same time, I think once you, um, once you're further on in your career, it will help you to have contacts. Somehow figure out a way, who do you know from a friend of a friend of a friend who is right. either working at the festival or who has had a, you know, maybe their, their film screen there the year previous. Talk to your filmmaking peers. And that's, that's what's also so great about the festival circuit is once you're actually on the circuit, you actually finally get an opportunity to meet your peers and your colleagues and, and kind of share war stories. Dan and I, my directing partner and I, didn't go to film school. Mm -hmm. We were completely self-taught. Mm -hmm. So we are always, in the back of our head, we're always kind of questioning, are we doing something wrong? Like through every, at every stage, every facet of the filmmaking. Or we, do I belong in the club here? Do I here? belong in the club? We've been doing this for 10, 12 years now. Yeah. You're still questioning if I'm doing it wrong. But once you're in the circuit, yeah. You meet some of your peers and they're doing the exact same thing. Well, and a good story is so, a good story. Yeah, exactly. But I guess what I'm saying is, is if you can take advantage of the community of filmmakers to, I think there's power in numbers in that sense. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, and I think you'd be surprised um, at how people will go out on a limb for you to just be an advocate for you, to make a phone call for you, to, to tell you know, somebody such as yourself, like, you know, hey, my, my buddy Brian is submitting your film. I just, just, just take a look at it, because mm -hmm. sometimes 
uh, and maybe this is myth, mm -hmm. but I, from what I've heard sometimes, like, if it's not, if there's nothing there in the first 10, 15 minutes, there's no reason to watch the entire film. I don't know if that's, if like the filmmaker myth or if that's actually true. But you Carl, do. do you want to spill that on uh, television no, right now? It's, uh, we try to see every film um, all the way through and have at least two or three people see it so that it, just one person doesn't dismiss nah. it. It's possible sometimes if a film, we feel like it, there's nothing that could happen in this film that would make me change my mind to this point that you, you know, it's like, yeah, it's like, yeah, that's what happens when I read scripts. So, so, right, the first right, 23 right. pages, you know, I don't need like, to There's read no the way this could be redeemed. I mean, sometimes <laughs> it's the worst part is that it's, it's, it's right there. Anything that's going to, you know, you're hoping for it to do, do something that's yeah. going to really wow you and you hope and you hope and you hope. And then you get the end and it's like, you're completely let down. Yeah. Whereas yeah. sometimes it's, a, I mean, you can, I'll admit sometimes the relief that the film is so bad, it's like, I just, you know, yeah. it's like half an hour is all I can take. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nothing and, amazing happened at the and end. And someone else can watch it, but I don't think it's for, yeah. you know, for me. But you know, it's, it, they, I mean, again, kind of the rumors that float in, at least in the filmmaking community is, you know, try to have some kind of hook in your first mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 10 minutes mm -hmm. of the film. But at the same time, you don't want to, you, you know, Keep keep the artistic preserve, preserve the artistic quality and direction of your film. Don't think about marketing no, you're, while making well, your film. At the same time, though, I would venture to say, like any good film, you still want to hook your audience either way. Yeah. But what you're saying minutes. really is that if this, this began back where we started talking about, you know, what are you looking for in a film in a festival? What are you doing as a filmmaker? It all comes back to story. You're really saying that if you have the right story, I think that hook's going to be there. Absolutely. Right. You, you know, tell but, the right you, way. but, but no right matter way. how hard you try to be chasing after something that just isn't a story that's compelling, yeah. you can manufacture as many so-called hooks as you want, and at some point, it's not going to yeah. really hold up. Much. And, and then that's when I, I do think, you know, look, like the the world of the festivals. Is is less of it. You, people don't go into the in, to you know work in the world of film festivals to make a lot of money. Right. They're there because they're film enthusiasts. So to so a certain degree, you just have to trust their sensibilities. And there are individuals out there at you know that are curating really amazing festivals, mm -hmm. and and you have to trust that they know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So there's to a certain degree when you when you are um, sending your film to them, yeah. you're taking a leap of faith. In the same vein that going and getting a film finance and actually going and making a film, you're taking a leap of faith. Well, it, you know, sort of uh, one of the big themes I'm hearing from today's conversation from your background and your own background is, you know, especially for people thinking about getting into this, is get in the, get in the community. Whether, I mean, I know that SIF takes interns and volunteers all the time. Yes. And you talked a little bit about paying your dues over many years. Even though you didn't go to film school, you were in the community mm -hmm. working uh, and you were around it, which then leads to relationships that can help you both in the making and ultimately in terms of uh, the world of distribution and film festivals. TJ, I want to thank you so much for being here. Congratulations on both your awards, the Oscar and a very important <laughs> award from Seattle it. Film Festival. And Carl, fantastic. I'll see you at the theater. Great. Okay, appreciate it. I'm Andrew Tsao, and I'd like to thank you for watching Backstory. I'll see you again next time behind the scenes.